Hello, John from the Lib Dem Podcast here. We are delighted to say that this episode is sponsored by Prater Reigns. Now more than ever, you need a professional-looking online presence and website. Prater Reigns have been helping Liberal Democrat campaigns succeed for 18 years. Their Lib Dem Foci package combines a website, social media and email system to help Lib Dems win. You'll receive great support from real people, fair pricing and a huge range of features to choose from. Prater Reigns are already the bespoke developers for Lighthouse, Lib Dem Draw Online and the LD Directory. They combine a talented system design with an unrivaled understanding of our party, our data and our systems. To find out more, check out the Prater Reigns website at praterains.co.uk slash liberal dash democrats. Now, on with the podcast. Tom and I can literally talk about this stuff like all year. <laughs> When Tom said he was on, I was like, oh my God, John's not going to know what he's let himself in. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Lib Dem podcast. Thank you for downloading and watching this episode. Now we've got something a little bit different today because in previous episodes, we've had people with lots of experience who have been in wards for decades and decades and decades. And it can be a little bit intimidating for people who are just starting out thinking, well, they obviously know what they're doing. So this episode is all about starting from scratch. You're in an area where Lib Dems have not been traditionally very strong. What can you do to help get a foothold in that area, to start making a difference in your local area? And we've got four incredible guests to help inspire you and give you confidence to go out and do stuff. And so this was, and my, the first one was requested by at least five or six people. So I'm very welcome to Hannah Kitchen. Welcome, Hannah. Please introduce yourself to the podcast. <laughs> Hi there, John. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm Hannah Kitchen. Um, I'm a councillor and also the Lib Dem group leader on Barnsley Council, um, elected in 2018. Brilliant. And then joining us uh, from Bromsgrove in the Midlands is Joshua Robinson. Hi, Joshua. Hi, uh, John. Thanks for having us. Um, yeah, my name's Josh. I'm a local party chair of uh, Bromsgrove. And returning for his second stint, we didn't scare him off, is uh, Tom Gordon from Wakefield. Hi, Tom. Hi. Yeah, so I am the uh, sole Lib Dem councillor elected to Wakefield um, and I was elected last year in 2019. And last but by no means least, we have Connor Kiernan uh, here from Wyatt. How are you doing, Connor? I'm good, thank you. I'm Connor. I have been a member since 2016 and I decided in the middle of a pandemic it was a good time to start campaigning. Right. Brilliant. Well, that's why you're here. So you can see uh, we've got a, a range of uh, different kind of levels of where you guys are at. So, Hannah, shall we start with you? Okay. So explain your story how did you get elected how was that process for you on getting started so I joined the party in in 2016 um I'm sure you can't guess why um and and got involved well so so my local party is Rotherham and Barnsley so we have a local party that um basically what happened during the coalition years was that that Barnsley local party ceased to have enough members to actually exist. And so it was, <laughs> it was pushed together with Rotherham. So, um, and I live on kind of like the very far west tip of Barnsley, sort of as a local authority area. So I kind of joined this local party, that, like didn't really have any relation to me and, you know, my area and, and where I live. It's just massive, great big expanse of places I never go. Um, and didn't really have a huge amount of, uh, of interest in, to be honest. But I joined anyway, because you know, I needed to do something. Um, and we we were lucky enough um, the following January to have a by-election in Rotherham, a council by-election. Um, everyone was kind of bored. It was the middle of winter. It was a fallow year. Um, and all of the Sheffield team got involved. Um, and specifically, I suppose, uh, Councillor Shafak Mohammed, who I think... If you're not familiar with him, you, you need to familiarise yourselves with, with that gentleman because he is absolutely superb. Um, and he sort of, you know, dragged me through really and got me engaged with campaigning. Um, and then, so before I got elected, you know, we had a general election. We had quite a lot of national and local by-elections. Um, so I really had a chance to kind of like 
get stuck into campaigning and I had support from people both in my local party and Sheffield local party to make something of, of where I live. So my ward is called Penniston West. Um, I live in the ward. That's where the majority of our members are out of the whole local party. Um, and we felt it was a ward that we could, that we could make a goer of really. Um, so, so that's what we did. So we, we put out a survey. It's always a good, a good <laughs> step, fly a kite, as Shafak called it, find out, you know, find out what people are thinking about things, you know, collect some contact details, um, and just see what's going on. Just to give you some context, um, I've lived in this area for oh, sort of 13 years now. And up until that point, um, I'd never been able to vote Lib Dem in a local election because mm. there was never there was never a candidate in my ward. And in 2016, which was the preceding set of local elections, there's 21 wards in Barnsley and we didn't stand a candidate in any of them. Oh. So, so when we say starting from scratch, you know, we are, you know, Literally. there was... Yeah. yeah, and when we first started doing surveys and started knocking on doors, um, there was sort of almost no point asking vote intent. There's no point asking how do you normally vote because like, the answer was never the answer was never going to be Lib Dem because mm. they literally only got the chance to vote Lib Dem once every four years, um, and then largely didn't still. Um, so yeah, so we, we we put a survey out. We we started doing a little bit of. We put some leaflets out first. So I think when you're in an area that's brand new and hasn't heard from you at all, if you go and start knocking on doors, people are going to be like, you know. Yeah. Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> who are you and what do you want? And particularly because that's not something that the, the other political parties have done. This ward has always swung between Labour and Conservatives. So Barnsley is as a whole, is heavily Labour controlled, as you would imagine. There were three Conservative councillors in the adjacent ward to me, um, which is which is very rural. Um, and my ward always sort of flipped between between Conservative and Labour. Um, so, so it's, a, yeah, kind of a, a sort of 50-50 vote, really. And, and that was how it was at parliamentary level for a long time. So we put some leaflets out, started telling people who I was, why you know why I was wanting to stand for the council? We had a really simple message, which was getting a fair deal for Penniston from Barnsley Council. Um, you know, I can talk in more detail about why we chose that message later if that seems relevant. But once we we put out, I think three or four bits of literature before we started knocking on doors, and then by the time we started knocking on doors, which I think was probably the January February um, with the local elections in May, people were recognising me. So we'd knock on the door sort of with our latest leaflet and say, you know, have, have, have you seen have you seen the, the latest leaflet? Um, and we were getting some recognition. Um, and the campaign just grew from there, really. And I won in May um, in May 2018 with with a 700 majority. Wow. 700 Wow. So, so, so did you stand, so you, you, you got going in 2016 and then w there was no, no, sorry. When did you actually start campaigning to win? So in, in, in my ward was really autumn 2017 because I right. called a general election, you know, we'd, we just got sort of tied up in, in other stuff and campaigning elsewhere. Um, and, and yeah, yeah. So it was a, it was at that point. Um, and just to make, um, life really exciting. I was also the candidate for the regional mayor at the same time. <laughs> in so, so Joshua, you, Joshua, you are the chair of your local party. So, what what can, what's the kind of story with Bromsgrove starting that and getting that moving? So, I'd, similar to to Hannah, I was like, I, I mean, Hannah could have just told the story of Bromsgrove if she wanted to, though, because it sounds very similar, to be honest. Um, I've been been around, obviously been at uni. I've, I've been a member a bit longer. I've been a member since 2012, but I've been at uni and 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 stuff. And I ended up in Bromsgrove. And when I joined Bromsgrove Local Party, there was four people uh, crowded around a room as an exec joined with uh, Wire Forest uh, Local Party. Um, and the, the, there were a couple of people who just kept the local party ticking. And fortunately, uh, along, along with myself, a couple of others, um, new people got involved. 
Um, one of them being uh, my now fiance Siobhan Hughes, and uh, who's our counsellor, and uh, Rob Hunter, who's a counsellor as well. Um, and we we started doing that. We we as I had saying with Hannah, we picked um, two wards. Which so my my motto always is is the right candidate in the right place at the right time. Mm. So it's it's pointless having the best candidate in the world if we put them up in a really labour facing area just after tuition fees it was never it would never end well um so we've managed to get um well three councillors now and all three of them were really well locally known uh, in their area uh, so we've had a so we've had a, we, we started by delivering leaflets and then after a, a few months started knocking on doors and that's when people realized we did it so the th- two of the three seats we stood in and one um last year we never stood in before and we ended up with um rob gaining 60 or 70 percent of the vote um and siobhan um over 50 percent beating the conservative candidate who'd been the councillor for 20 odd years i believe mm. so we're, we're really happy with that so we are growing um and, and even you go to the general election last year where it was dire in most places uh, we managed again to get the right candidate in uh, David Nicol, um, and um, we went from losing our deposit in uh, 2017 to having a proper targeted campaign of actually only concentrating on our council seats that we'd won or we want to win the county seats next year and managed to get 12.7% of the vote. So we are building, uh, I think I'll just say, I, we do is what Hannah does. <laughs> so yeah. I think Hannah put it better than I did, but that is what we do. <laughs> and Hannah's kind of ruined my show notes that I had planned about kind of like, <laughs> you know, you might not win on your first attempt kind of thing and, 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 and you know, set yourself little goals and, and kind of and having that two or three election strategy. I actually think Hannah might have frozen. Uh, yeah. but we'll, we'll, Either that, or she's being, or she's really listening intently to us. But uh, she'll come back on at some point. Um, but you no, know, really important. You said about getting that start. And Hannah has drifted off. She will come back in, no doubt. Um, now, Tom, you've been on the podcast before. Now, your experience, because I think some people are quite nervous about starting. And so, what what was your story, and how did you get over that kind of that hump to think, right, I'm going to start? So, yeah, I, again, not too dissimilar to what Hannah's already said. Um, I am now elected for my hometown, which is Nottingley, which is the furthest away ward from Wakefield, which is the local authority. Um, So for me, I was first elected as a councillor in Newcastle in 2018. We had all ups um, because of boundary changes and I was elected um, for a one year term up there. Um, and then at the beginning of 2019, I moved home, told the residents I'd be standing down because I was taking a, a new job at the University of York and then moved home. Um, and when I was moving home, it was a case of me thinking, oh, well, I've now I got involved with the Lib Dems in 2017. So I think out of you all, I'm the newest member, actually, which is slightly <laughs> terrifying. Uh, and you've been a council in two different places. <laughs> yeah, I've worked for an MEP and everything else and all that. And now I work for the party in my third job for the Liberal Democrats. Um, uh, but yeah, so um, for me, basically, when I moved home, I thought, well, I've seen it all in Newcastle, um, went through to help uh, in Sunderland, where they were having a lot of great success through there as well, um, and basically thought, well, I'll give it a crack when I move, when I move back home to, to Wakefield. Um, and not too dissimilar to what's already been said, like the local party here was barely functioning, um, I think is the polite way to put it. Um, <laughs> And um, it was a case of we, when I moved home, we, I was talking to them um, about, well, what have you done in terms of polling day before? Like, and they were like, oh, we've never run a polling day operation as a local party. So I was like, okay, like this is really, really starting from the sort of bottom end of things. And um, we'd largely had paper candidates, but we'd never, we've still not yet had a full slate of candidates across the entire council area. Um, That is hopefully the goal. Yeah. for some point soon um but i yeah the ward that i i stood in in my hometown we'd not had a lib dem stand ever really uh not since the council was created um 
And um, yeah, similar to what Hannah said in terms of we just started, I started sticking out some surveys, seeing what the issues were. Um, I was sort of, sort of fairly fortunate in that respect. So when I went to uni in 2012, um, the town still had a library, a sports centre, swimming pool, household, household waste recycling centre. And then when I moved home in 2019, all that had gone. Um, everything had been shut down as well as like we'd lost the fire station, police station, the sure start centre. Basically any local service, whether it be provided by Wakefield or, or higher levels, um, had just been gone from the town, it had been gutted. Um, so I had quite a lot of issues to run with, which uh, I suppose is sort of fortunate in that respect. But um, yeah, so like I said, I moved home in, in sort of a January, February time and was elected in the May. So it was like a quite short and intensive campaign. Um, and certainly at the beginning, like, I didn't really feel like I knew what I was doing. Um, I was working full time as well. So sticking leaflets out before work, sticking leaflets out after work, sticking leaflets out on weekends, any spare time. It was just, just literature everywhere. Just keep throwing it through the letterboxes and hopefully we'll get somewhere. And we did. Um, so, yeah, I ended up being elected uh, much to the surprise of the Labour Party. Um, so Wakefield, it's that the current composition, well, the composition was 49 Labour, 11 Tories, two independents and myself. Um, so Labour lost at the last uh, local elections. They lost three seats, two to the independents and one to me. Um, and I think it came as a bit of a shock to them, uh, particularly because my town, we had the last deep coal mine in the UK, which shut down a few years back. Mm. We still got three glass factories and a power station. It is an Yvette Cooper's uh, constituency so um, I don't think well the, the problem that they had is that they just didn't run a campaign um, the councillor who'd been here and it was up for election had been in post for 27 years and um, I think it got to the point when they put out leaflets I think it probably did them more damage because people were going wait you've been meant to represent you me you can't speak you're meant to have represented us for 27 years and who are you <laughs> but yes yeah. yeah, so that, that's sort of what happened here really <laughs> and congratulations on having the most northern sounding uh, area ever Every, everywhere down south is probably think that's what all northern places have they have a mill they have a coal <laughs> mine uh, uh, you know and, and a whippet stand or something like that um, right so, and finally we go to connor now connor you're in an interesting room because you're part of my local party but in an area that we have had no work at all done in a very, very long time in the, the two parts of the Preston and Wire local party. So why don't you talk about what you've done, because you've only just started getting active. Yeah, so I just started when the pandemic hit, sort of in March, April, now it feels like a lifetime ago, it's, it seems like ages ago, but um, when the pandemic hit, I decided to finally get involved after years of kind of being an armchair member, as I like to say, because um, I'd met lots of great councillors at uni. Richard Kemp will be happy to hear that he is um, at Liverpool John Mills University. He is the journalism development's favourite contact. I think I heard that man saying that. talking, me. that's why. <laughs> that's why we love him. We love him for that. Three years, I heard nothing but Richard Kemp. And then <laughs> I moved home and kind of like Tom, kind of had that thing of, because my family split between Poulton, which is in Wire, and Blackpool, coming home and the difference that you saw between those three years was quite shocking. So like we'd moved to Poulton and, you know, I don't drive and all of a sudden you pretty much couldn't get anywhere unless you drove, came to Blackpool and it was, you know, development after development after development, but still nowhere to live and everything mm -hmm. else and all of these poor decisions that were quite obvious. So then when the pandemic hit, I thought, finally got time, I have no more excuses. Um, so I think I badgered the local party, I think, a bit um, until you gave in, and I'm glad you did, I have to say. Um, it's been a great benefit to you as well. Um, and then after that, I just, I just hit the ground. I did my first boardwalk with you, and then within a month, I'd reported about 100 pieces of casework. Um, and then I was kind of benefited by the fact that the local councillors, they've been so unopposed for so long, you've taken it for granted. Um, which was horrible for the community, but it was a good opportunity for me because then it gave me a lot of things to report. And by the time I got the letters out, which I've done recently, I don't think my phone has stopped ringing um, mm -hmm. from people just surprised to see someone. At the, the, the most feedback that I've gotten is not always great to see a Lib Dem or anything negative about the party or anything else. It's just been, it's so nice to see someone actually bothering to take the time. And I think for anyone starting off, that's, the main thing for me, I was nervous about, oh, people are not going to, people are going to be like, oh, you're a Lib Dem, a true blue area and all that nonsense. 
but people really care about you caring about them. And that's the one thing I've taken away from it so far. And I think, we, and I think what all your stories suggest is, actually, a lot of people who are new to politics thinks that it's an absolute bear pit all the time. You know, and you think of examples, I'm going to say something like Hull, where the Labour Party and Lib Dems proper go at each other. I think that's normal. When actually, throughout the country, most political parties are quite weak. And actually, of all colours, and actually you get yourself a little bit of momentum, and suddenly they have, there's not any kind of push back against you. Because, you know, councillors sit in seats unopposed or with virtually no challenge whatsoever. And that's why also you get rubbish councillors. You know, you get councillors who have no interest at all in turning up to local events because they don't need to. They just assume they're going to be right. But what I'd like to ask you guys now, and I don't mind who comes in, is how you selected your seats. Now, that's because Connor, it was, it was the seat he moved into. You know, now, what other discussions happened with you guys about, did you think, right, I'm going to sit down tactically and think, okay, where is my best opportunity? Similar to what you were saying, Josh. You said you were. There's no point in being in an area if there's a better area next door or something like that. But you know, we're in that kind of time where you know people might not have the chance to go to a different ward. So, okay, someone start us off now with saying, how did you pick the area that you ended up being? We started on in um, really doing something in 2017 um, in the county elections. Now we had one very keen person uh, who wanted to stand, and that being uh, and councillor now at district level Rob Hunter um, and we chose that area because that's where he lived uh, mm. but we also chose it because that's where our members were and that's where our support was so Bromsgrove does span a distance so it is it's obviously it surrounds parts of southwest Birmingham um, so you, you most of this most of the population is in Bromsgrove so he had a very very good go in 2017 having never stood there uh, before and, and came second in the county elections and then that just then went from there so obviously then you have three district seats in in that county ward so that's where two of our councillors are from so actually we did sit down quite strategically but it was fortunate that one keen person was the person uh, you know who, who, who stood in that seat it was to me our best place anyway um, but I, I mean, you could stand in, in most wards, I, I find, because in most wards you'll find casework. And if you find casework, as Carla said, people really appreciate the work you're doing. So um, any, to me, any ward's achievable. Some are, are winnable. Some are just a lot more winnable than others. Mm. Yeah, so where, you know, where I stood was, was, in, was essentially where I lived. And it was quite sort of serendipitous, really, in that the local party had sort of been keeping an eye on on my ward because that was where that's where the vast majority of the members are so out of um sort of 120 members across Barnsley and Rotherham we've, we've got about 30 35 40 just in these two Penniston wards wow, um, that's quite and a it's, lot. it's yeah. largely due to demographics it's, mm. it's largely the demographics of uh, of the areas and you know the sort of people that might join the Liberal Democrats um, so so that was an easy decision really um, in that it I you know I wouldn't I personally wouldn't want to represent a ward that I don't live in I know a lot of people do and do that very successfully but but for me you know I needed that connection to my community um, and it's quite an easy ward well, I say that it's it's got a town in it, mm. um, which is obviously Penston, then some sort of surrounding villages, um, which makes it you know you've always got a story and you've got an anchor. You know, people see themselves as coming from Penniston, so it's quite easy to anchor people to that. And then in terms of our other target ward, so in 2019 we got three more councillors elected, um, so one in my ward um, because obviously that's you know that's the best way to do it is to get your ward companions and then two two in other wards one was again we had an enthusiastic campaigner who was very keen to be a councillor who wanted to represent the area that he lived in um and that you know sort of capitalized on years of just labor neglect really to be honest just labor complacency um and then the other ward actually was quite interesting because we 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 found an issue 
um, in that ward, um, basically the, the Labour Council decided in their infinite wisdom uh, to build a massive three lane, three lane directory roundabout on a small urban park, um, which you can imagine how pleased the residents still are about that. And I got involved in that because it's my, it's this side of Barnsley. So it's the road that my residents drive on, you know, to get into Barnsley. Um, so I got involved and they were furious that I'd got involved. It's not in, it's not in your ward. It's, not, it's nothing to do with you. Why is Councillor Kitchen sticking their oar in? Well, you know, because my residents asked me to, it's not difficult, is it? Um, so I got involved with that and got involved with the campaign group and sort of started, started pushing that um, as an issue. And then we actually approached one of the members of that local campaign group and asked and asked them if they were willing to stand for us. Um, and he said he was. And mm-hmm. we got him elected. We got him elected to that ward um, in in 2019. Um, I, for us as well, there's an element of parliamentary boundaries. So the ward that I'm in, the adjacent ward and this issue ward, all sit within uh, the Penniston and Stocksbridge constituency, um, which is a, a constituency shared with Sheffield. And, and that's where I was the candidate in, in 2019. Brilliantly well. But, but that's, you know, that sits together as a constituency. So it, it made sense to, you know, to target those wards and build up our profile within that parliamentary constituency and Sheffield doing the same on their side of the border. Um, so, yes, so there were those other considerations. I mean, we'd love, you know, there's all the there's all the wards on the other side of Barnsley, you know, over in the Dern Valley, which are, you know, demographically completely different to mine, you know, um, a lot of ex-mining communities, you know, quite significant levels of deprivation still um and i would love us to get councillors out there because they need they need better representation than they're getting you know labor take them for granted so badly um but we don't have that we don't have the membership out there and we don't have i don't i don't know it you know it's not it's not where i live it's so we don't have this we don't have anyone that's got a story and i think before i finish someone says to me repeatedly people vote for a story and an emotional connection and while doing case work and stuff is brilliant because it shows that it shows them that you're willing to work hard what people really connect with is is that personal story and that emotional connection um and i think to some extent it doesn't matter how hard you work if you can't make that connection with voters you're going to struggle to win them over Mm. So I mean, this I, I'm not breaking any confidences with uh, Connor here because we ha- we had a chat didn't we, Connor, when you first decided to get active and you were really I thought mm, this guy you know every as you go so when someone says I really want to get keen and get active all lived down kind of go ooh uh, kind of a new person um, and we had a, we had a com- yeah <laughs> we had a con- we had a conversation about because the power base in our local party is in around Northwest Preston where I've been a councillor for ten years. Um, and we had a chat said, so did you want to, because in Lancashire county elections, you could stand anywhere in the thing. Did you want to come to an area, learn from an area that's already pre-existing, has development and stuff like that, or did you want to do something in your own patchway, in the, literally the opposite end of the, of the constituency to where our power base is? But, and, and we had to make that choice, and you had to make that choice. Actually, you said, I want to make a difference for too long the Tories have got away with doing bugger all in my patch. And that was, that was the ultimate decision we came to. And, and since then, it's been brilliant because suddenly a whole load of members, not loads, maybe about a dozen or so in that area, have suddenly thought, wow, we've got someone to kind of hang our hat on, so to speak. Yeah, and it's been very beneficial that I've been um, haranguing them with phone calls and emails ever since then, ever since I got that <laughs> list. It helps a great deal. Everyone is starting out and don't be afraid to email other members because they tend to reply. Um, but no, for me, it was, that, it was that thing that you said. I could have come over Pre- Preston North way and, and done it that way. But for me, kind of like what, what Hannah was saying, given my background in journalism and storytelling, it's going to be a lot easier for people to grasp me, the person who lives in Poulton, campaigning in Poulton for Poulton people, than it would be 
this person who's dropped in from elsewhere. And I think as well, there's a perception um, that I had, particularly when I spoke to other kind of young Lib Dem members at uni, that they had the impression of a lot of political parties drop people in. Mm. And especially in the area around here, because we've had lots of, you know, debates for years about MPs being dropped in from Brighton and God, all over, God knows where, um, to kind of just fill a seat of people being like, we want to have someone who is one of us. Um, actually taking the time to represent us. So I think Hannah's right in that thing of kind of goes back to what I said before and kind of what everyone said, having a narrative and being able to prove that people here are actually, are actually caring and we're not just taking each other for granted is a really positive way to do that, step, you know, going forward. And I think talking as well about going to other wards, obviously my family's kind of divided across the entirety of the Fylde Coast now. I think as long as you have a stake and you have that thing of being able to say, well, my grandma's down the road, my uncle, my auntie, whoever, then people are going to get behind it more than, hi, I just showed up. <laughs> it, is, it is interesting from my point of view, because I have never lived in the ward I've represented. It, 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 so I, I, I mean, again, my, my ward definitely wasn't a start from scratch. I'd been lived them um, for, say, 30 years. But the, the idea that it was somehow easier going into coalition, having to defend a ward that had been lived them for so long, it was a, it's a, that's, a, that's a lot of pressure to take on. But I thought if someone's listened to it, it's not absolutely essential. But if you don't live in a ward, you, I suppose from my point of view, you have to be seen as Mr. In my case, Mr. Cadley Ward or whatever. You have to see to be that community's champion in that ward. And Tom, mm. is that how you... Did it when you moved back to Wakefield, you thought, right, I've got to invest in this area. I've got to become like the local champion for that area. Yeah, it was all the other way around for me. So when I was in Newcastle, I, um, when I stood there, I was with um, my two ward colleagues, Greg and Doreen. And Greg's been a councillor there for like 20 years, Doreen over 10. So when we had all ups and they needed a third, it was very much a sort of, like trying to make a story in Newcastle, really. Like I went to uni there and... Um, like it was my home um but then when i moved yes yeah, so it sort of did the other way around where like very much that was the case when i was first elected um, and then when i moved home to home it was just a case of I'd, well i'd admittedly been away for like the best part of a decade um but was able to pick it up like my gran lives in the area she lives next door to me <laughs> um <laughs> literally across the driveway and she i, I think one of the things that when we were coming back to storytelling, like, and the idea of a narrative, like, I think it's very, like, that is more powerful. And I think one of the things that I really benefited from was the fact that my gran goes to her over 60s knitting club. She goes on a coach trips with all her friends. And we know demographically older people vote. Mm. So when you've got Sue there, we are knitting needles every Tuesday evening down at the Guild Hall telling people, my grandson's running for council. And he's the only one who was doing anything. Have you got his leaflet yet? <laughs> like, I mean, it was things like that where you... Where, like the idea of family and community, I think, was very much what massively sort of made me win here. Um, I went to the local, like, high school. Um, one of the things that I did find really strange, actually, is when I moved back home, they were like, oh, are you from here? You don't sound like you're from here anymore, because I'd been away for, like, the best part of 10 years. And uh, when I moved to uni up in Newcastle, no one could understand the bloody word I said. <laughs> my old is that broad <laughs> me and my friend Alice who's from Huddersfield we'd be able to have conversations and everyone just look at us like, what are but um so no it was slightly strange actually coming back and um the labour lot caught wind that I had moved home and that I was still technically elected in Newcastle and they were beating me around the stick with the look at him he's a career politician I was like well one minute I've just gone into darkness first and what happened there the, the Labour Party no, no. <laughs> But no, so like, <laughs> they were beating me around the head with the stick of always a career politician. I was like, if I was a career politician, would I really have moved to like home to a mining town in like the north of England? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> doesn't really ring true, does it? But um, yeah, so for me, like the reason, like when I came and spoke to the local party, we, the most councillors we've ever had elected to Wakefield was about 10, 12 years ago or so now. And they were all in Osset, which is literally the furthest away ward from where I am the complete other side of a district, um, like 20, 30 minutes in the car, um, straight down the M62. I know when I said 20, 30 minutes, people are like, oh, that's not far, but straight down the motorway for 20, 30 minutes. Um, and like the local party were like, oh, well, we had councillors there before, so wouldn't it make sense for you to stand there? And I was like, 
just because we held somewhere 10 years ago doesn't make it a logical place to go now. Um, and that was one of the things that even now when we have exec meetings and we're looking at targeting campaigning, we're like, oh, what's it? And I'm like, no, not what's it. Wherever we've got yes. someone who's okay. local. Yeah, exactly. Like wherever we've got people who live, where they preferably want to stand and where we've got issues, not targets for the sake of previous history, because we know that's not relevant. And I suppose you're now in the position where you'll be thinking, okay, once you've made a breakthrough, I get that. So you'll be thinking, so you're the council, you're the Lib Dem on, in that ward. Is it a two or three member ward? So we have three, they're all three member wards and we have 21 of them. So yeah, so, we're like the thirds. So. so are you now then, is the next step for you to try and fill that, those other two places? You've had that breakthrough and now is it to consolidate it? So hopefully like that's very much a plan like we should hopefully be doing well here we've now got a small team so when i moved home i think we had like two members in my ward it was and i was one of them <laughs> um so it was very much like bare bones we've now got i think we've got nearly back i think we're just shy of 10 so we've like grown like it might not sound like loads but we've then still got loads of people who actually get involved and deliver for us so like the last round of focus that i delivered uh, we got we recruited another like six or seven deliverers so like we are growing and we are doing things even if we've not necessarily got the members but yes it's very much like the natural progression is to hope you pick up the second in my ward and the third in my ward um, we've got an, an, another candidate in um, a neighboring ward but one who wants to stand and win there and he's putting out leaflets doing all the right things um, I think what's quite frustrating for me is that at Wakefield, like it has been so Labour dominated, like it's always been Labour run as Wakefield Council since it was created. Um, and there was a brief spell where there was no overall control, but were, even then they were propped up by like one or two independents. So they've always just ruled the roost and done whatever they wanted with little to no scrutiny because the Tories don't do anything. So what's slightly frustrating is if we were to have like 21 candidates and loads of money in the bank, like we could absolutely go Health and leather eye, and probably pick up like two thirds of awards. It's just obviously building that capacity, the fundraising, um, and getting that messaging. So it is slightly, yeah. But so hopefully picking up um, my ward again next time round, and another couple. Um, but fundamentally, depends on like if we find people who want to win, then there's absolutely places in Wakefield that we can win. Yeah, and I suppose on all local pies, you have to assess you if you overstretch yourself and win nothing then that doesn't, that doesn't help anyone. You, ha you have to be a little bit, understand how much manpower you've got. Again, me and Connor, I've had a chat about um, how much it would take for him to win his, his borough award compared to the county division. You know, and there's a massive difference from going from under 2,000 houses to suddenly 7,000 houses. What is that capability? What are your capabilities? Go on, Hannah. Hang on a second, John. You, you only have... Now, let, let's just get some things into perspective here. Okay, here we go. Uh, <laughs> just in defence of units you met. So, my ward has uh, over 5,000 houses in. And Sheffield, so Sheffield City Council wards are seven to 8,000 wards. Yeah. Seven to eight thousand houses. When when people start, when people with district councils start talking about, oh, there's eighteen hundred houses in my ward. I'm like, well, you can on that four times a week, can't you? <laughs> right, there you go, Connor. There's your challenge. Uh, I want, I want four times a week now. <laughs> or go and win the county. Yeah. <laughs> now I, I want to ask you. Oh, actually, what right. was what was the most nervous or challenging thing about starting up actually for you guys what what was the thing that you thought oh my days I'm not looking forward to that I'll start this one. that's all right so for me it was like I knew all the theory of it like I'd done it before seen it in action helped on by-elections but it was just the sort of the for me it was the figuring out is it working and like having that doubt in the back of my mind like no it's so overwhelmingly labor here they get two-thirds of a vote like it's just like not believing that actually what we were doing was making a difference. Um, and obviously you don't know that until you start knocking on doors and speaking to people. Um, and we didn't have much capacity to do that. And we did that quite late on. And then mm. even then it was sort of like the, uh, doubting the data, like mm. looking at the numbers and going, well, no, of course, like 
if I mean, when Labour are getting 66% of a vote usually, and then you're knocking on doors and you're like, where is the Labour vote? And I'm there going, well, where is it? Where is it? This can't be right. And actually, no, it was just that the Labour lot were complacent and crap and lost the voters. Mm. So I think it was just that sort of self-doubt that even though you like, you can pick up any sort of guide from ALDC or the party or anyone else who's written a book on Pick a Ward and win it and apply it, but it's just that sort of having that self-confidence to believe that actually you can do it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, when you, you're knocking on people's doors and we had the, our fan, fantastic candidates who got elected, you, you, you're putting so much time and effort in those like really late nights. Um, and you're just sitting there going, we knocked on this last year and it, it was rubbish. How, how is it so good this year? This can't be right. And actually feeling that, to me, you know, it's different if you're, you, you're going to be elected as a councillor, but to me, it's trying to help people win those seats. It, uh, it was really quite nerve-wracking because they are doing amazing work in district, on, on our district council. But it would have been so bad if I woke up on that Friday morning and we'd lost. And it's that self-doubt that I find was the hardest, hardest thing to overcome. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Sorry, Connor. Yeah, two things for me. One, I just really, I loathe losing. I just, I really hate <laughs> losing. I'm, so I used to, I used to say, I used to think that I wasn't competitive. And when I said this to one of my university friends, she just absolutely like weed herself laughing. <laughs> I, I thought she was just being horrible, to be honest. And then I heard this thing on the radio and this woman said, I'm so competitive that if I don't think I can win, I just don't bother taking part. And like, that's just, that is 100% me. So like campaigning for the Liberal Democrats, to be frank, is quite a long way out of my comfort zone because, you know, we do, we do, a, fair, we do a fair bit of losing, don't we? And like the <laughs> thought of the humiliation of like working, putting 13 leaflets out and, you know, knocking on all those doors and, and then not winning, like it was just a really quite unbearable thought, to be honest. And then the other thing for me as well is, um, is, is relying on that team. So Tom, Tom is like a bit of a one man campaigning wonder. Um, he does it all. Like he needs to learn to delegate, yeah. but, but he has the skills to do it all. I don't, I can't, I work leaflets. I can't, I can't run a printer. I can't, I mean, I can enter telling data on connect and I can like, look people up but i i fundamentally you know i can't use connect i'm like really i can't use lighthouse i'm i can't use nate i can't use any i'm just not very good at any of those things <laughs> <laughs> so i and because as we've discussed if i don't think i'm going to excel at something i just don't bother going there so i have a team around me of, of people that do that and that is i think you know quite a constant source of anxiety to me because at the end of the day you know we work with volunteers in this mm. game you know this is people who give their time for free and then in addition we ask them for money because mm. you know because their time just isn't enough um and so so yeah i think i think that's the thing that that probably has and still does continue to make me nervous and and I think that's particularly over the last six months because you know unlike Connor <laughs> we've all retreated into our little holes <laughs> over the last six months um and you know sort of kept our heads down and um and the last year's general election was bruising and that constant need I think to rally people up and bring people along with you and and build your team I love it that's the bit I love but it's it's tiring, you know, it, it does feel tiring sometimes. What about you, Connor? When after that first conversation with myself, what were you, what were you most scared of? Um kind of well, kind of to follow on from what Hannah said, um I've I've always been someone kind of in the little hole poking the head out, but not getting very not getting very involved. Um and I've always used to, with my background in journalism, being the one on the other side of the other side of the camera or the situation in a way. Um so for me initially it was getting over that thing is I'm going to be the person that people focus on to come to things to sort out and I'm not just going to be the person in the background you know twiddling away and sorting things out um, and then as it went on me as a person I love having a plan like a solid set plan 
um, and if there was, I suppose, a glorious little plan that suddenly Dem activists had found somewhere, and as Hannah said, would be the exact opposite, and they'd be winning all the time, and it'd be wonderful. Um, but there isn't one, um, and that kind of set in to a bit of anxiety. I felt, felt a bit like imposter syndrome at times, like I'd be walking around and I'd be thinking, who are you to start walking around and start complaining about potholes and curves and everything else? Like, no one's going to listen to you. Shut up. Um, but I think, especially being in a situation where I don't I have a team, obviously, with John and everyone in Preston, they're all lovely. But with no one super local, it was mm. finding those people around me who are very supportive about it. And luckily, my family are very enthusiastic about me and getting out there. But that was a main thing for me of kind of looking around me and like, oh, I'm actually... I'm actually going to do this. I'm actually going to do something completely different. Um, and as Hannah said, is that was completely, completely, maybe mad to do it in the middle of a pandemic. But um, you know, masked up, hand gelled up, and just get on with it, don't you? <laughs> do, you do you think what that new starters who are starting from scratch also have to have a little bit of expectation management as well? Yes. I mean, you talk about uh, Hannah about when um, you hate to lose. Well, my first campaign I started, I did a two-year campaign to try and take out the Labour leader in Preston Mm -hmm. in a seat we had never even, you know, we hadn't really fought that much. And I got within 1% and lost uh, by 52 votes. This was in 2010. Uh, This was so... It utterly, utterly knocked me for six. You know, you're physically knackered, you're mentally knackered, you're emotionally knackered. Um, and you have to be prepared that you, no matter what happens in politics, it's basically, and you have to be ready for a few bumps in the road. Mm-hmm. But then six months later, there was a by-election. I, I won it, and it's my 10-year anniversary next week from being elected. And so there's always more opportunities. But, and it kind of leads into what I, I hope, I mean, Hannah, she, she disappeared off screen when I was actually praising her for ruining my show notes by saying you need a two, ele- two or three election strategy just in case you don't win and then get to 700 majority. Um, but I think that is important that you have to set yourself a goals. So Connor might not win the county seat next year, but he, could, he knows that the district seat might be two years after that. And, and is, that, is that important that they realise that? Or do you think actually... You've absolutely got to believe you can win, but there is kind of a being realistic in your expectations. Is that important? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Connor. You go ahead, Josh. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the, the, the two, to me, the two most important things when you're looking to build up a city is one is expectation management. You don't want to lose by 1% and then just think, oh, no, forget it. I don't want to do it again. Because as you've pointed out, there is an, there's always an opportunity around the corner and you can get elected and change people's lives, and that's what we're in it for. The other thing, sorry, just go back to what Hannah said a minute ago, was about um, she's got a great team around her and build a team. I've known so many areas that they build up, and it's just one-man band, and then that that one-man band goes and lives the other side of the country or leaves the party, and that's it for that area. They um, they never do anything ever again, and what was the point of those two, three years of building it up? So there my, would be my, so yeah, expectation management, but also build a team around you. I think I think was going to disagree with me. <laughs> no, no, not really. I mean, I think, you know, I think there's a number of things, isn't there? I think if you've got a political following, I think that the next, so there's a, we obviously know there's a lot of local elections coming up next May. And I think that, I think that's going to be particularly hard for those of us in Labour facing areas. Mm. because Labour have got a new leader. And he's not exactly setting the world alight, but he's also not Jeremy Corbyn. And I think that, I mean, it's always hard for us in Labour-facing areas because people forget we exist. But when when I say people, I mean the Liberal Democrats. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, so I think what we'd hope to achieve in Barnsley in this May's local elections is actually not necessarily us but I think what we what we can what we might see in terms of Lib Dem gains against Labour might look different next year than it than it would have done this year and the other thing I want to mention about expectation management is kind of the um the the kind of the Lib Dem handbook for campaigning yeah so one of the things we're really big fans of here in Barnsley is just kind of like 
tearing that up. Um, and we like, we really like slaying sacred cows. Like, why don't you hand address 5,000 blue envelopes? <laughs> well, because there's three of us, Chris. And <laughs> it, it's just literally not going to happen. In fact, we're not even going to put our blue letters in an envelope because we haven't got time to stuff them. We're just going to shove and poo people's doors like that, you know, you know, and, and you know, things like try and get teams of six out canvassing. Mm -hmm. That would be absolutely splendid. But actually it's mostly just going to be me. Never go canvassing on your own. Okay. Well you can choose. I can either go canvassing on my own or I can not go canvassing. Like that is literally, that's literally your choice right here. And, you know, try and get 30 people to an action date. No, um, you know, so you know, we, do, we do sometimes, but when it, you know, when it comes down to Barnsley local elections, when Sheffield have got local elections at the same time, when Rotherham have got local elections at the same time, when Wakefield have got, there's going to be three of us mm. running all around Barnsley on, you know, on polling day. That's like, that's just the reality of it. So, you know, so in terms of expectations, you know, when you go along to these big national by-elections, where they're getting 100 people a day through the door, you're not going to run that campaign. In and your... I think an important point to add to that then is the way you kind of compensate for that. Because again, again, I'm in a fairly small local party. Okay, we had, a, we had a good year in 2019. But our local party, our canvassing group was very small. People are actually confident enough to knock on the door. So what we, we just started early. Yeah, we started yeah. before, you started, so... You know, a lot of times it would just be me and one other person doing it. But if you're doing that every week, it's amazing well, how many houses you can get through. And the other thing I do as well, John, is I, I canvas on a Monday morning and I canvas on a Wednesday afternoon because mm. I've got I've got school age kids um, and a husband who works extremely long hours. Um, you know, he's out of the house for 12 hours a day. So that kind of like the best time for canvassing is between five and six in the evening. Well, I'm sure it is. But, you know, I've got two, I've got two whinging children. In normal times, we'd be at gymnastics, swimming lessons, drama, choir. You know, I'm rushing around trying to get everyone fed, you know, trying to make sure everyone gets to bed at a reasonable time. I cannot go canvassing at that time of day. And in the general election, I had to pull in a massive amount of childcare to be able to canvass at that time. So I actually went on Kickstart and my mentor said to me, well, when are you free? And I'm like, well, I don't know, like Monday afternoons. She's like, we'll go door knocking on Monday afternoons then. Yeah. Because if you know, you, if you, you'll get to know your ward. So people starting off from scratch might think, oh my word, it might be a 5,000 house, uh, house ward or something like that. And you'll think, how am I ever going to deal with that? But you'll get to know, actually, this is an area that has a predominantly high amount of retired people in you can call them during the day and actually maybe get a better response than you would if you did the six o'clock at night, particularly. And I have no problem with canvassing during winter as well. Again, yeah. again, that's something that some people say, oh no, you don't want to canvas as it starts getting dark at four o'clock. These people aren't hedgehogs. They're not going to run away from you. <laughs> they put a light on. But uh, Tom, how, what do you think? I mean, Hannah's talked about ripping up the rule book there and sometimes you've just got to roll up your sleeves and get it done. Is that how you kind of feel? Yeah, I think... I you can think disagree. Say, am I allowed to say this now? I'm once again employed by the Liberal Democrats. Am I allowed oh, to I say do everything but I tell you not to do? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, in all seriousness, I think it is about understanding, as you've just said there, your ward and your circumstances. And I know like when, for instance, it was a general election and I was one of the national field organisers through in Leeds for a bit before being drafted into Sheffield, like there was certain people who for religious reasons would not knock on doors on Sundays. Like, so that was, just, I mean, and I tend to find that in my neck of woods, knocking on doors on a Sunday is absolutely the best time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of times I've been invited in for a Sunday roast, fantastic. Um, bonus so, that is on a canvas session that, <laughs> if that doesn't encourage people to go out and canvas <laughs> not the most productive way of uh, speaking to people. you get the whole family around don't you but um, no so like for me like it is about applying it to your own situation and, and most of the time like if you are the candidate or you are the key campaigners like you will know better um, obviously sometimes you can end up with if you have a candidate candidatitis where you seem to mm. fall into the trap of thinking that you know everything and 
sometimes it's nice to have an outside perspective too to tell you if you've been wrong or daft or silly which um, again I think that comes back to the sort of self-doubt I was talking about earlier um, so I mean one of the things that I do all the time if in doubt is I'll ring around people whether it be in Newcastle or whether it be Hannah in Barnsley or whoever it is or someone from Sheffield or, or, or I mean just to sort of run it by people and I think that I mean is Absolutely. I think as Liberal Democrats, we have a lot of good ideas and sometimes we silo that and we keep it to ourselves and we don't really think to tell people. Um, so I think, I mean, that to me is probably one of the better ways to get around those sort of issues. Um, one of the other things, though, for me, I was thinking actually what we were talking about earlier about um, sort of problems that you have when you're starting up. Like when I was standing at home, um, for Nottingley at Wakefield last year, one of the things that I hadn't really prepared for or thought about was actually how nasty and intimidating it can be when you've got the machine of a Labour Party. Once you've woken them up, mm. um, that can be really, really intimidating. Um, I mean, I often overestimate the opposition parties as having all these canvases and been really competent, and largely they're not. But even so, like I think if you are starting up somewhere new and you are largely running a one-man show or even a small team, like it can get really intimidating really quickly. So like I know on polling day, when we had our polling day operation in my ward last year, we had the three Labour councillors stood outside one of the polling stations slagging me off to everyone who was going in, which mm. is like a 25-year-old then, um, like, and standing and hoping to win and having done all this work. Like, you can just sort of hit you out of the blue, but like, what the, like, because I would never do that. Obviously, mm. other parties have different degrees of what they think is acceptable but um and then as well like I had um sort of quite a lot of nasty stuff shared on social media and I think um particularly if you are on your own or starting out like that can like eat away at you a little bit and make you start doubting yourself and I think that can feed into it but um I think one of my biggest sort of fears that I have like particularly when I was starting up and doing things was very much sort of losing touch with residents and as well like that to me was like what if I get set in my ways really early on and start thinking I'm doing things right and it's not feeding through um so I mean and particularly getting like drowned out drowned down with meetings and I you mean know, exec and local party sort of stuff so I mean one of the best things that I when I went away to kickstart last year um one of the things that I got told was like for whatever whether it be a Lib Dem exec meeting or whether it be now I'm elected as a councillor, uh, whether it be a council meeting, however much time I spend in meetings, try and make sure I do the same amount actually in the ward um, to sort of keep touch and touch base with it so that you don't forget about it. Because if not, you can just find yourself eternally sort of sat out working and doing things and not actually getting out there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, and, and we, we like, said... We set our campaign as just a, a very modest goal. We just say, look, go out, just do an hour a week. Just do, it doesn't even have to be no knocking, just get out there to your ward, feel the ward, walk around the ward, you'll find casework. And not only will you be visible, but also, again, it gets you used to the ward. And I suppose one thing that comes up, I want to touch a little bit on canvassing. I know canvassing we can't do right now, but it's probably the thing that most new starters are scared of. Or oh, what if they slam the door in my face? I, can, I, I worked out, I've knocked on 30,000 doors in the 10 years I've done it. And honestly, the amount of people that have given me proper grief is probably less than the digits on one hand. It really isn't that bad. But also, I want to, particularly, you know, you guys that have now been elected uh, or, or, and have run campaigns, there's an interesting change in canvassing. When you first knock on a door, a lot of people will be like, mm, never met you before, and a little bit cagey and stuff, because they haven't seen any a Lib Dem in 30, 40 years, however long it will be. But it was remarkable. When we took a ward that had been Tory for 40 years last year, it was the second time we canvassed them. And you know, when actually we'd canvassed the first time and they, and they said, all right, that's very nice. Thank you very much for coming around. The second time then we thought, wow, that's when we knew we were getting through to them because suddenly they'd seen us, they'd seen our leaflets and then it, the floodgates opened. They told us all there, you know, right, we're Labour leaning, but we'll vote you this time and stuff like that. Is that, is that uniform across the patch? I mean, Josh, is that how it happened with you guys? Yes, as I said uh, a little bit previously, we uh, one ward we canvassed and then one year and it was, we had an area in it and we thought, oh, that's bad. I went and uh, canvassed it 
the week before the election with the candidate and I've never seen him happier. Uh, it was a, it was a great experience. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, you do get the odd person that's going to not agree with you, but I mean, don't waste your time with them. Is my, is my, uh, my motto, you know, there's no point of having a conversation with someone who's going to continuously have a go at you for 20 minutes when you can knock on five more doors and probably get a couple more votes out of it. Um, and, and a little bit, I, sorry, I agree with a little bit with Hannah again. So that's my favourite line today, which is great. Uh, the, we'll start, um, I agree with Hannah, T-shirt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, was, was the bit about, uh, don't, don't wait, for the, so you say canvas, don't canvas on your own and, and stuff like that. But yeah, so don't wait for the, the dream of having 20 people out canvassing for you, a big canvas team, because it will never happen. Go out, go and knock on doors on your own, you, and you will be pleasantly surprised, I would find. The, the thing we found um, was that it wasn't that people weren't used to, be, to seeing a Lib Dem. People weren't used to being canvassed. Yeah, they, at all. Yeah. At all. So if you knock, so I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of spending an evening knocking on doors in Bedford, um, where obviously, you know, we've got... Mayor, Mayor Dave and you know we've we've run the council for a fair while and like I mean you know bearing in mind I'd never been to Bedford in my life I didn't know anything about it I'm from Yorkshire you literally knock on the door they open the door they see the Lib Dem raise out they go yeah hi you go I'm just wondering how you're and they go yeah I'll vote for Dave but I'm not I'm not sure what what party I know I might vote Conservative but yeah I'll probably vote Lib Dem and you go okay thanks bye and <laughs> you lock it down we, people wouldn't give they wouldn't tell us they mm. would not tell us how they normally voted because no one had ever asked them before mm. and we just couldn't get any canvas information out of people at all and then what we found as the campaign went on was people would tell me but if i sent like if i mean i, I didn't know tom then but if tom you know came came canvassing with me they wouldn't they wouldn't speak to him they wouldn't tell him anything because <laughs> i didn't why why has this woman got right random people out knocking on doors for her that's very weird we've trained them up a bit now and you know they're, they're they're more used to it and I think just to pick up on what Josh said um I did canvas on my own a lot but I would say the caveats to that are um this is my home it's where I live you know I know it it's it's a nice area you know it's a mm. It's a safe area. There are parts of Barnsley I wouldn't canvas in on my own. There's parts of Sheffield I wouldn't canvas in on my own. But but my home, you know, where I am, I do feel comfortable. I wouldn't canvas on my own after dark. You know, I, I do. I do only. Actually, that's a lie. I did it in the general election because I had to. But <laughs> I feel I wouldn't. And tell someone where you're going. Make sure yeah. someone knows where you are. And don't go into people's houses. I've made that mistake before. <laughs> but if you do have one or two of you, it's amazing how actually that can ease. So even if you do get a right woman on the door, actually, someone that you could laugh it off and go, oh my word. Like, I, I was dealing with a new, a new canvasser. Um, last year who knocked on a door and he says I've been waiting for you do-gooders you know uh, when are you gonna why are you stopping us bringing back the death penalty and I thought right you're on, you're on your own there John have a good time <laughs> kind of, but, actually, but then you laugh and have a joke about it afterwards because as Josh kind of point out you know the next door you come to is someone who really appreciates the fact you fixed that pothole or you've done something else so it's but what about what about you connor are you what i mean you have yet to do canvassing obviously because of lockdown we haven't done so what what are, what are your feelings towards it someone who's brand new to it well as someone going straight into it from being like brand new i decided to take part in the phone banking and um, during the pandemic um so i was, I was going to say so i've listened to everyone um and i was and the one thing that stood out for me is I was very nervous about it. So I decided to take up some of these phone banking things first. Um, and I think that for me, it was a great gateway for me um, mm, because really? bring cold calling people on the phone, um, I suppose it's the same as knocking on the door. Um, and it gave, it gave me the confidence to kind of get out there and do it. And I think the, de the difference definitely showed because obviously I haven't been out canvassing, um, but that has not stopped people approaching me and I'm stuffing letters through the door in a mixture of responses. Um, and the first time, I remember people shout, shout, yelling across the gardens because pandemic time um, at me about Liberal Democrats and whatever, and thinking, oh my God, why, why is this person talking to me? What's happening? Um, and then after doing the phone canvassing, um, it, was a lot, it was a lot more easier and a lot more fluid um, to kind of get into it that way. And I think for a lot of new members, um, kind of linking back, I suppose, to 
managing expectations. They expect that they just, <laughs> I expect they just get shoved out on a door with a, with a badge on, kind of going, you know, get out there, go knock on doors, what are you doing, why are you wasting time? Um, but there are those opportunities out there to do it a bit slowly and take those little gateways into it, I think, um, that they need to consider going into it because um, it, is, it is quite daunting. Um, and it's good that everyone gave great advice as well. <laughs> Arts job and keeping notes, so you know. And I suppose one thing we should all say that if any of you or our listeners and viewers are watching now thinking, you know what, I really could use with a bit of advice, just approach Lib Dems about it. Go talk to any of us on here about our experiences. We are more than happy. Or you can talk to the ALDC. Or there'll be, there's always a buddy system where if you're struggling with anything, you are not alone. I absolutely guarantee you, all of us have probably gone through all of it in the past. And, uh, and actually, that would be my top tip is that you, you, sometimes it can feel overwhelming. How am I going to get through a thing? Go on, Tom. Yeah, so one of the things that I would say as well is absolutely drag other people with you. If you're starting up and you're new, like what, this is, for instance, like we've now, like I've got another person who's hoping to win and do things in his patch, um, like a bit down the road. And like, if you are worried about canvassing, then even if you've got a councillor from a neighbouring local authority, like I know when I say, like I'm not the councillor for his area, but I'm like, hi, I'm councillor Gordon. I'm here. I'm elect. I mean, you've got a title, use it. So even now, I find it really strange people actually respect the title that I have for some reason, because I'm still me, but to them, I'm not. I'm Councillor Gordon. Um, mm. So I think, like, absolutely, like, try and drag other people in too. Um, yeah, I think that's, I mean, you know, I, I started from scratch here, and my team, you know, my kind of local team, we're all brand new, you know, we're all, we're all 2016 or, or since, um, but we've not done it on our own. You know, we have had massive amounts of support from Sheffield. Um, you know, like I say, Shafak Mohammed is, is, is one of my, you know, closest Lib Dem friends and, and sort of supporters. And he, he's always, always at the end of the phone for me. If I want support, if I, he frequently gives me a kick up the backside, you know, come on, Hannah, time to put a survey out, go and do this, ring your members again. You've not rang them for ages. Um, Mike Shaw, um, You'll not know his name because he keeps his head down. But he uh, he, he used to work on, he worked on the Clegg campaign um, between 2010 and 2015. And, you know, Mike's kind of like my political other half, really, you know, in terms of messaging and strategy and, you know, literature plans. You know, we're, we're a team. And while I've got, I've got no experience, he's got, you know, a, a decade of experience. And there's, and I think, and, you know, through attending by-elections you know I've met people like Claire Hallowell and, and Chris Lovell and, and Abby Bell and you know taking up training opportunities and getting to know really I guess the great and the good in Lib Dem campaigning I sometimes do things that they say we're not supposed to do because I'm like that but you know it's constantly having you know know who the find out who the brilliant campaigners are in the party and pick their brains because they've all got something in common, which is they want to see more Lib Dems get elected. Um, when we say building from scratch, we don't mean doing it on your own. You know, find your allies, find your, me, and, me and Tom talk, you know, every, every week, you know, bouncing I ideas off each other. Um, and that's, you know, you need that. That's really important. Have you got that, Josh, where, where you are? Uh, the West Midlands is quite a, quite a, a a derelict sort of region we don't have any mps for example you know yes. we came nowhere i think there are there are dotted around a few people so i mean I, I echo the advice from everyone there that basically it's up to as well it's up to people like us as well to get in touch with um people from water from areas that aren't um, doing anything to see how we can help because obviously we are as you said all elected all, all lib dems because we want more lib dems around it's you know I, sometimes I think we sort of wait for someone to ask like, go oh I want to do some campaigning well you know we've done it now so why don't we offer our support more and it's amazing how reciprocal that can be so um like I say Blackpool's one of the strange ones and and Connor I, I'm going to bring Connor in as well. because Connor's done such good work we're now talking the Blackpool Lib Dems which I've got no elections next year at all one of the few places I've done I'm going to use Connor 
and his campaign as a way of learning and it's kind of a reciprocal arrangement so i don't know if you want to talk briefly about that Connor, and then what we'll do is to kind of wrap this up because i realize i've kept you all quite a long time but it's been a brilliant discussion i would love for you all to give us your top tip for someone starting from scratch but Connor, we'll talk to you uh, first yeah so um obviously with that, like i said we're starting from scratch scratch yeah, so it's a completely blank canvas. And then um, we were talking, I started talking to one of the candidates who is weird because she's kind of half in Blackpool, half not in Blackpool because um, of the way the boundaries are sorted out. Um, and she was standing just north of me. So I got to talking to her because we literally bought each other and I was like, we need to help each other out because I'm not doing this on my own. And I need someone with me. I was like, you're coming, my hook back, Rocky helping me out. Um, and then she was very active in the Blackpool group um, and started talking to them. And as John and I both found out, I suppose John knew before me, obviously, um, they hadn't really, it wasn't out of lack of effort that they that they'd got in a situation where they were just, Black was a very difficult place um, for Lib Dems. It's not the type of place you expect us to be making games or inroads. Um, and because of that, he never really had anything to kind of congregate around and get excited about and, and all that stuff. So when I, when I came along and I started talking to them and then they've all kind of naturally just got involved with it because it is that reciprocal thing they see that helping me will help them um and i think that's the important part of it and it kind of goes back to what everyone else was saying about finding a good mentor you know i've been very lucky to have john and a lot of the rest of the lot and um, who are really good at what we do and for me as well it was taking that time to realize what skills i could offer on top of just being a candidate so i took up a volunteer position and with the local party on comms, because that's kind of my background and what I'm experienced in. And that has done just as much to teach me about how things work on the inside. And it also means I'm not just shoehorning myself as well. I'm just I'm just that candidate out there. I'll, I'll just do that and then not get involved in um, anything else. So so yeah, it has it has been very good. I can't remember what else you were talking about, John. I just I was gonna say what's what's your top tip? What's your top tip? So oh, you've yeah. just so what would be your top tip, Connor? <laughs> And my top tip would be to not be afraid of getting involved. Um, kind of like what I literally just said. Um, don't shoehorn yourself. Um, turn around to yourself. Look yourself in the mirror and say that you are good. You are worth the time. And that, you know, you can get involved however, you, however much you want to get involved. It's not anyone else deciding for you what's you know, your campaign, what your area is going to be like, what your campaign is going to be like, anything else. And if you're not comfortable with it, you need to speak up and say, I want it, I want this. So if you don't ask, you're not going to get. Tom, what about you? What's your top tip? I think I would say, like, don't worry about getting it wrong. Um, I know like if I look back at some of the literature that I did 18 months ago I would absolutely just scream at it and say why would you do this what is wrong with you you absolute heathen uh, <laughs> and then now I'm doing stuff and it's apparently good and other people are using it in other places like so don't worry about getting it wrong um, making mistakes and I would say also don't always think that just because someone is either older than you or has been in the party for 40 50 60 years that they know better than you um sometimes that can be detrimental when people think oh well we've always done it this way so we must still do it this way and when you look at some places like that might be why we're not winning now when we did win there previously um and then, yeah, one more thing I would add as well is like, if you are like an individual person or a gem in a small team and you're trying to start, like you can still get data from councils, like have some absolutely fantastic, get some FOIs, request for data, ask for everything. Um, some of the stuff that the federal party stick out, like template press releases are really helpful because they give you the data. But like, go away and ask for things, and yeah, you know I mean, try and try and be smart and see what what obviously. If you see a nice glossy press release about Labour or Conservative Council are doing X, Y, Z, dig into it because quite often you'll find really good issues, um, and those make the best campaigns. Josh, what are your what's your top suggestion for someone starting out? A, a little bit like uh, what's just been said. Don't don't be afraid. Basically, yeah. You want to get involved because you believe that your area is going to be better. So every seat has uh, has 
a pl- I can have a plan. So whether that's someone who's never done anything in their ward ever up to us winning MP seats, we all have a plan. So don't be afraid. I say, as Tom said, you will put out some pretty rubbish leaflets probably at some point and you will look back at it and go, it's bad, but it's probably better than putting nothing out. Um, so don't be afraid. You will make mistakes and try and reach out and uh, and try and engage with more people because there are people across the party who can help. So. I, I suppose the, the other thing, my point of view is having done this now for like say 12 years is actually looking back at my hairstyles over the last 12 years have been utterly horrific along with the leaflets but uh, um, final word will go to Hannah Hannah what's your top tip for anyone starting you know I'm going to go for something super super practical uh, which is if in doubt put out a survey so so, survey (laughs) surveys are just brilliant uh, because they they collect data so you always put a vote intent on your survey um, you know, you collect data, you collect contact details. So um, we should have put out more surveys because then we would have had more email addresses to send emails to during lockdown. Oops. Mm. Uh, and also what you find in these areas that have been taken for granted by either the Conservatives or Labour for a long time is no one's asked, no one's asked mm. people their opinions. And, you know, don't, don't get too het up about it you know you can call it a you know a 30 minute survey or a environment survey or a traffic survey or a um recycling survey you know don't unless you're really smart with connects and you're planning on you know sending out like targeted street letters to people who are over 75 and use buses and own a green (laughs) bin you know to some extent you know processing the data from the, for the answers to those questions don't matter. You know, when you read through them, it will give you an idea of the issues and you can tally if those issues match with what you're thinking. But you don't need to record every, you know, we just record voting intent and, and contact details. And what we, what we do, we put out a survey quite close to election day on something quite benign. And as well as the voting intent, we have a little box that says, yes, exclamation mark, I'm voting for Hannah. And so those people that come back with a, t- so rather than it being like a, you know, which party best represents your views, if you're looking for solid data for that upcoming election, you come back and these surveys are like tick, 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 tick. You know, that's an absolute definite. How is that person voting on polling day this way? Um, and when, you, when you're one person trying to canvas 5,000 doors on your own, that is a really efficient way of collecting data and people just love it you know because they like telling you they like telling you the views um put a self-addressed envelope in otherwise you're wasting your time and put an online link as well but yeah when in doubt put out a survey we're like oh god we've not contacted anyone for a while what we're gonna do we're gonna do a survey (laughs) <laughs> there we go. Well, all I can say on behalf of uh, myself, just thank you all for coming on. I really appreciate it. I don't know. I don't know how much, how long we paid you for to actually stay on, but I feel like uh, we've got the money's worth out of you anyway. <laughs> but um, no, thank you, Josh, Tom, Connor, and Hannah for coming on today. We really, really, really appreciate it. And like I said, to all our viewers and listeners out there, if you have any questions, if you're not sure about anything, either contact the Lib Dem Pod at, at Lib Dem Pod or email us at uh, libdempod at gmail.com. We are more than happy to pass on anything to these guys if you want to ask them directly, or you can find them all on, on Twitter or social media or whatever else. There is always someone who's been through what you've been through. So Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much to these guys for being on. We've got loads more episodes coming up with not just guests, but also great campaigning tips like this. So do subscribe to the Lib Dem podcast so you never miss an episode. We are on YouTube. We are on Facebook or through your podcast providers. So thank you very much for tuning in and we'll have another episode very soon.